Hey guys, Will here. Welcome back to the channel. So we are getting stuck into another overclocking guide today for you guys. It's been a long time since I've done one of these, but I have this brand newly built 9900K system here with a Z390 Aorus master motherboard, which is a motherboard that we haven't done here before on the channel. So I thought it'd be a good opportunity to do a guide for you guys. So if you want to check out the details on this crazy build here, there's a link to the video series on that above my head for you right now. But the focus of this video is going to be the overclocking of the 9900K and Z390 Aorus Master Motherboard. So we're going to keep this relatively simple for you guys. I've done some detailed overclocking guides in the past for the ASUS range of motherboards, the Z390 and the Z370 chipsets, as well as an overclocking guide for the 9900K processor specifically. So in those videos, we went into a lot of detail about exactly what all the individual settings do, how they impact performance and you know what you need to be monitoring and things like that. Now, what I've learned through reading the comments on those videos over the course of the last year is the majority of people just want a quick start guide. They're not really interested in learning all of those finer details. So if you do want to learn about that stuff, I'd encourage you to check out those previous videos. All the settings that we use on the ASUS motherboards are pretty much the same. They're just found in slightly different places in this video. So if there's anything you want to learn more about having watched this video, go back and check out those ones and that will fill in the blanks there. But we're going to keep this short and sweet for you guys to get you up and running as quickly as possible. Now, I'm going to be using settings here that I would typically use for a system that I'm building for somebody else. So we're slightly milder on the overclock. We're not going to be pushing quite the same voltages that I would if it was a system for myself. But because we want to make sure that it's rock solid stable and something that's going to be dependable for years to come, we're, um, we're doing it this way in this video. So this should be really good for anybody who's just wanting a sort of set and forget style overclock that they're not having to monitor. So you're not really wanting to get into competitive benchmarking or you know really become an overclocking enthusiast. You just want to squeeze the most you can out of your system without having to think about it too much. So this is the video for you if that fits your profile. So anyway, let's get started on the overclocking. All right, so you'll need to enter into your BIOS, which is the screen that you can see here. The way you do that is when the PC is first booting, you press delete repeatedly and it will jump into this BIOS screen that you see now. Now, if it is the first time that you've been into the BIOS on your PC, you'll be greeted with the easy mode. What you want to press is F2 to switch into classic mode. And this gives us access to all the things that we're going to be adjusting today. So the first thing that you need to do, and this is very important, do not forget to do this, go across to save and exit and save a profile Call it fail safe here. You can actually see I've already got profiles loaded for my three different configurations. So when I go profile one, we're going to save it as our fail safe. That way, if anything goes wrong with what we're doing today, we can always go back to the settings we had before and everything will be fine. There's also a CMOS reset button on the back of your PC as well, which you can use if there's a problem. Now, if even that's not working, most motherboards these days do have dual BIOSes. So if worse comes to worse and you can't get in at all, you can always boot using the other BIOS, reflash, and then start over. So it's pretty hard to brick a motherboard by anything. Well, it's impossible to brick a motherboard doing anything that we're doing today, really. But if you do have a situation where you can't boot, there are safeguards to get around. It. And there's always posts on the Gigabyte forums for ways to fix that. But anyway, we'll exit out of this now and we're gonna start making some changes. So we saved our fail safe profile. We'll scroll back across now to MIT. And there's a couple of different areas that we're going to be working in today. We're going to make some adjustments to our frequencies. We're going to make some adjustments to our memory settings as well as our voltage settings as well. So we'll start off with frequency here. The very first thing we want to do is scroll down to extreme memory profile and set that to enabled. So the column on the left hand side there is the speed that is currently set to under the profile that we've got set. So 2133 megahertz is the default speed for DDR4 RAM. What a lot of people don't realize is that uh, when you buy RAM that is say 300 megahertz or 3200 megahertz or something like that, it's actually overclocked. So DDR spec is 2133. Anything over that is technically an overclock. And what the manufacturers do is they test their RAM to that overclocked frequency with the timings that they stipulate as well and then they sell it as that. So if you don't go and select this in your motherboard, it's actually going to be running a lot slower than what you thought it would be. So that is one little thing to be aware of. Even if you're not overclocking, you always want to make sure you do load your extreme memory profile. So we're going to go ahead and set that to profile one. And you can see now my speed is set to 3000 megahertz. Now we don't need to make any adjustments to voltage or anything like that here. I find that the Gigabyte motherboards do a really good job of their automatic voltages, at least for memory and motherboard related things. We'll have a look at that in a bit more detail in just a moment though. So scroll back up now 
to our CPU base clock. So this is the frequency of the base clock of the CPU. This is multiplied by the multiplier and that gives us our final clock speed. So if we have a multiplier of 50, for example, and a base clock of 100 megahertz, that will give us a five gigahertz final clock frequency. So we're gonna leave this set to automatic. Generally speaking, it will automatically default to 100 megahertz anyway. Now you can overclock this slightly, maybe five, 10 megahertz if you're lucky, but generally you will find that you get instability here. So I generally recommend against doing that. Just leave it at the 100 megahertz mark and that is generally a lot more stable. What we wanna do now is scroll down to our enhanced multi-core performance. We're gonna disable that because we want full control for ourselves. So at the moment, our CPU clock ratio is set to 36. We don't want that. We want to set it to 50 to give us our five gigahertz. But there is one other adjustment we need to make as well to achieve this. So we're gonna set our AVX offset to zero. Generally for five gigahertz, I'm finding on the 9900Ks and the 9600Ks, uh, AVX offset, you can generally set to zero as long as you're not going over about five, 5.1 gigahertz. Uh, if you are finding that you're getting instability under AVX instruction sets, so certain games, certain applications that are now using AVX instructions, they're a lot heavier on the CPU. They draw a lot more current and you know they're a lot more thirsty on power. So generally speaking, if you're having problems with stability only under AVX, you can insert a offset here and that'll actually bring the clock frequency down by whatever you set it at here whenever you're under AVX. So say you have your CPU set to five gigahertz, you can then set an AVX offset of one, two, or whatever you want. So say we set it to one, then our CPU would come down to 4.9 gigahertz when we're under AVX instruction. But we're gonna leave that set to zero for now. Just keep an eye on it though. If you are finding that you're getting issues when you're under AVX instructions, you can set it back to one, two, three, or whatever you need to. Generally more than three isn't necessary but it should be all fine. So we also have our uncore ratio here, which is like our cache frequency. Now I generally speaking, leave this to automatic for most client builds. If I'm overclocking my own machine, I tend to set this at around sort of 46, 47. Uh, generally around about 300 megahertz below your core frequency is, or below your CPU frequency is okay. Uh, anything above that you start to get some issues, but it does introduce some glitchy instability sometimes, some weird behavior. So uh, I generally find I leave that set to automatic for the most case. The, um, the performance gains you get from adjusting this are very, very small anyway. So you don't really need to worry about that too much. So just leave that set to automatic. Now we scroll down to Intel Turbo Boost technology. So we wanna switch this on. Enable, make sure it's on, it should be on by default anyway. And now we wanna set each of our cores to be five gigahertz. So you can see here by default, it's actually bringing down the frequency the more cores are active. And that's the reason why sometimes you might see five gigahertz when the CPU is not doing anything. But then as soon as you start to load it up with multi-core type instructions, the CPU clock frequency starts to come down. So what we wanna do here is set all of those to five gigahertz. So you can hit enter and scroll through until you find the number you want, or you can just type it. So we're just gonna type it here, just type five zero, five zero, five zero, five zero, five zero, five zero, five zero for all eight cores. And now we will be locked at a constant clock frequency of five gigahertz, regardless of how many cores are active. Now you can also adjust here whether you want the CPU to be able to adjust its frequency based on load as well. We wanna make sure hyper threading is set to enabled. We wanna turn off speed shift technologies so that we get that five gigahertz all the time. Now this will also depend on your power profile inside Windows. You wanna set it to the high performance mode to stop the uh, CPU frequency from coming down when you're not under load. I tend to do that, you don't need to do it, but uh, I figure I'd rather have it running at the maximum clock speed all the time so it doesn't have to react. Can also reduce a little bit of instability. Sometimes you can get a little bit of instability when the CPU changes frequencies, but generally speaking, it's not really a problem. So it's up to you whether you wanna disable that or not, but uh, disabling it will allow the CPU to remain locked at that five gigahertz constantly. You can also disable your sleep states here as well if you wish to. Uh, sometimes that can help with stability as well, but generally speaking, I'm just leaving these set to automatic for the gigabyte motherboards or the Aorus motherboards, I should say. So uh, next thing we wanna do now is go back into, so hit escape a couple of times. We wanna go into our voltage settings. So hit enter here, ready to go into advanced power settings and we're gonna set our load line calibration to turbo. Now what this does, you can see down the bottom left hand side there, you've got a little graph that shows a slope down. Now what this setting does is it allows the CPU voltage to, or the V-core to droop slightly under load. And this avoids spikes in, uh, in voltage when you're coming on and off transient loads. So the VRMs have to actually react or the capacitors need to charge up and discharge depending on the amount of current that's being drawn through them. 
and the reaction time is a little bit slower than what the CPU needs. So what load line calibration does is it allows a little bit of V-core droop to avoid those little spikes. Now a channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking has a fantastic video where he goes into a massive amount of detail on this and I'll link in the description below for you guys for that one. Uh, generally speaking, you want to have it as low a setting as you possibly can to avoid the spikes, but you also don't want the CPU core voltage to droop too much under load, otherwise you end up having stability issues and you end up having to have your voltage under idle too high. So it's a bit of a balancing act between the two here, but I find setting it at turbo avoids those transient spikes as well as reducing the amount of droop to an acceptable level where you should be pretty stable. So if you have a 9600K, you might be able to get away with high or even medium for the 9900K generally turbo. If you go any higher than that, you start to run into overshoot issues. So uh, turbo is the setting that I would recommend there. Everything else on this screen can be left on automatic. Hit escape again and we go to CPU core voltage control. Now I'm going to be using a fixed voltage for this overclock and I know there's a lot of debate out there about fixed versus adaptive voltage. So the argument for adaptive voltage is that it reduces the amount of power consumption under idle or low CPU uh, usage scenarios. But uh, look honestly guys, the amount of power difference in terms of the power consumption is very 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 small. We're talking less over the course of a year than you would have you know forgetting to turn off a light in your house for a couple of hours or something like that. So the important thing Thing to understand here and I'm not going to go into heavy tech on you guys but uh, yeah what you need to understand is that the power that a CPU is consuming is based on the based upon the work that it's doing so if it's under idle and it's sitting at low voltage it's not uh, it's not drawing much current to begin with so it doesn't really matter if it's running at low voltage or it's regular voltage that it would be under load because the current draw is low it's you know it's really not doing anything anyway so the difference in power consumption is very very tiny so for the sake of simplicity I'm going to be going with a fixed voltage here this is generally how I overclock most of my systems and have done for you know since forever uh, now there are arguments out there as well around you know reduced lifespan and things like that honestly you know, most people these days aren't going to be keeping a CPU more than a couple of years anyway. I've got systems that I've been running this way for over 10 years now and they're still running strong. So I really don't see this as being a, you know, a problem in terms of longevity of the CPU either. As long as you're not running crazy high voltages or anything like that, you should be absolutely fine. So let's push on. So what I'm going to do here is set my voltage to 1.3 volts. So you can increase this in 5 millivolt steps. You can also type a number in as well, but it will jump to the next start uh, 5 millivolt increment. We're going to set it to a voltage of 1.3 volts to begin with. This is a voltage that should be good for most people at 5 gigahertz. You might be able to get away with less. You might need a little bit more, but 1.3 volts is about the limit of what I would recommend if you're on air cooling. You might be able to get away with a little bit more, but uh, yeah, with water cooling, you can generally get up to about 1.35 volts is about the safe zone for me. Uh, this particular system, because it's got such high-end cooling, I can get up to 1.4 volts pretty safely in terms of temperature, but I generally don't like to go over about 1.35 volts for daily use anyway, uh, just to keep things in the safe zone. But if you are on air at 1.3 volts, you definitely want to keep an eye on your temperatures. Now, I do have another video where I go into all the details on that, my uh, stability testing video, and I do recommend you watch that after you've done this to learn how to stability test your machine. But yeah, you definitely want to be keeping your temperatures at around sort of 75 to 85 degree at a max maximum mark uh, under complete 100% load uh, when you're stress testing and things like that. Generally you'll find at that level under gaming conditions you'll be closer to sort of 65, 70 degrees but generally around sort of 75, 80 degrees is where I want to be. 85 is my upper limit. If I start to see 90 degrees I know that I'm starting to push my voltage too hard and I need to come back down a little bit. So you'll find here it's a bit of a balancing act again. You'll need more voltage for higher clock speeds but you'll also introduce more temperature when you go higher on the voltage. So it's really about finding the sweet spot, adjusting and then coming back and testing more things until you find it. But 1.3 volts at 5 gigahertz is a pretty good starting point for the 9900K. Uh, for the 9600K, I would recommend 1.25 volts as a starting point. Uh, for this particular CPU, I'm able to get away with 1.28 volts at 5 gigahertz. But again, 1.3 volts is a better starting point. Everything else here, you can leave set to automatic. On ASUS motherboards, I generally set my VCC IO and system agent voltages to about 1.15 volts. But I'm finding I haven't had any issues with this motherboard and it does seem to control voltage quite nicely. You can see here, we've only got 1.050 volts here for our system agent and 0.950 for our VCC IO. On ASUS motherboards, they tend to overvolt these pretty nastily. So yeah, on Gigabyte motherboards, you just leave these set to automatic and it's fine. And that is pretty much everything, guys. So what you want to do now is you want to go back across 
to save and exit and you want to go to save profiles we're going to save this as our five gigahertz profile so we'll just hit enter type it into five gigahertz and enter again and then once we've done that we can go up to save and exit boot up the pc hopefully it will boot up successfully and then you can get started on some stress testing okay so once you're all set up it's time to boot up into windows and do some stability testing so i have another video for stability testing where i take you through all of the ways that i normally go through testing to make sure that my system is rock solid so if you do have problems booting up after overclocking then there's a couple of things that you can do to troubleshoot that you can have a look at your uh, cpu voltage and you can go up a little bit if you need to remembering if you're up around that 1.35 volt mark already you're probably going to not want to go too much higher than that anyway and you'll probably want to actually reduce your clock speed slightly so say for example you're at uh, you know trying to try for 5.2 gigahertz at uh, 1.35 volts and it's not booting you probably don't want to go higher than 1.35 volts anyway unless you really know what you're doing and you've got awesome cooling uh, so as long as your temperatures are sort of around that 80 degree mark uh, you're probably going to want to actually drop your CPU frequency back down to see if that works. You might still need to adjust your voltage from there. So basically it just becomes a balance between, you know, having your voltage at a point where it's stable and pushing as high as you possibly can on the clocks. Now, once you have got it all stable and it's all booted up and it's working, you're going to want to do a couple of cycles, basically trying to get your voltage as low as you possibly can while still remaining stable. So I generally like to stability test at least for an hour each time just to make sure that it's all working. And then for the final overclock, once I'm happy that everything's all good, I generally run it overnight just to make sure that it's absolutely rock solid. But details on that are all in that stability testing guide for you. But just basically want to make sure that your temperatures are sort of around about 75 to 80, maybe 85 degrees on the cores of your CPU at a maximum. Anything hotter than that, and you're definitely going to want to be looking at lowering your clock frequency and lowering your voltages just to try and keep those temperatures down a little bit more. Now remember that stability testing does push your temperatures higher than general usage will, but uh, you know if you were ever to get into a situation where you got a lock or something like that was going on, system hung and it was hung at 100% CPU load, you could get into a situation where it gets pretty toasty. So just to keep things safe, that is my general process. So I really hope that you guys have benefited from this quick guide. If you do want any more detail on any of the specifics, do check out those other videos that I mentioned before. Links are in the description. And if you have any specific questions, make sure you hit me up in the comments or in our Discord community, and I'm happy to help you out there as well. But that is it for today. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button if you've enjoyed the video and found it useful. Make sure you are also subscribed and hit that notification bell as well so you don't miss future videos. And uh, yeah, guys, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.